So it's my pleasure to introduce the second speaker of the afternoon, Andrea Garner from the Institute for Molecular Medicine in Finland, the Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, and Andrea um, finished his PhD in 2015 in epidemiology and biostatistics at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. Then he was a postdoc in, in Boston at MGH, Harvard Medical School and the Broad Institute. And since uh, two years, 2019, he's now a, a, a FIM Emble group leader at the Institute for Molecular Medicine in Finland. This is FIM. And since the same year, 2019, he's also an instructor at Harvard Medical School and, and MGH. And he's already leading um, two big initiatives, the, the COVID-19 host genetic initiative and the Intervene Consortium, which tries to combine electronic health records with uh, genetic information for phenotype prediction. He's uh, the recipient of an ERC starting grant, and he's doing as you can tell from this um, CV, exciting work at the intersection of epidemiology, genetics, and statistics. Uh, we are happy to have you here, Andrea, and we are looking forward to your talk. Okay, thank you so much. I'm very glad I'm invited. I'm, I'm also happy I don't have to speak about COVID-19 because uh, lately I'm speaking a lot about COVID-19, but I'm really excited about speaking something else. And specific this project is the first time actually I'm presenting this work. Um, so bear with me if anything is clear. We are just finalizing um, the sort of the analysis, but uh, um, I think it's quite interesting. And I thought for a, a school, um, a summer school in machine learning, this can be mo more relevant than just uh, yet another GWAS. So. Um, so I work in Finland, and in Finland we are um, collecting a lot of health data, as in much of the Nordic country, because people tend to trust the, the state and the government. And uh, uh, back in the 60s, we were collecting very few information just about cancer. And then over time, you start to see how we collect more and more, starting with the inpatient um, registry, we capture all the hospitalization, the outpatient, we capture uh, you know, daily visit to the hospital. And really you have a big jump in 1995 where every uh, single purchase of a drug done in a pharmacy in the country start to be registered. And finally, more, more recently, um, we, we start to have also uh, primary care data, though we don't capture necessarily those that are in the private healthcare. Uh, so, so an increased in, uh, amount of information. And so to uh, leverage all this information and do fun stuff, we decided to start a project, which is called FIN Registry. Uh, now, to you, to you will look kind of simple. In reality, it took three years of paperwork uh, and a lot of applications and uh, um, uh, some sort of political skills. But finally, we managed to put together quite a comprehensive a set of registry that are available for, for the entire Finnish population. Uh, in total, uh, just to give you a sense of the share of data size, around 4.1 billion medical encounter uh, uh, across several different registry. The cancer registry is the oldest one collecting information from the 50s. Uh, the population registry capture uh, some of the demographic information, for example, where you've been living, if you were married, uh, and uh, importantly, all the family relationships. So with your spouse, with your mother, father, who are your siblings and so on. This is very important for the project I'm presenting later. Um, then we have some uh, uh, registry that are for hospitalization, some registry with education, job occupation, uh, longitudinally starting with the census in the 70s and then collected from the 90s on, on yearly basis. Uh, and also which kind of uh, uh, university degree have you taken in which subject. And then if you receive social assistance, both you and your spouse, um, a lot of information, this is also important for the project, I'm presenting a lot of information about uh, your, your birth information, when you're bo born, uh, your weight, uh, if it's a true IVF, uh, is your mother a smoker and some uh, diagnosis at early age. Uh, and finally, drug purchases and primary primary health care, although, as I mentioned, uh, not yet the primary health care that goes through um, a private primary health care, which is a little bit more common than um, uh, this hospitalization, which is mostly to public, but still like many people go to private uh, primary health care. Um, so this FIN registry project, uh, it's really about leveraging this nationwide health information to explore 
risk trajectories of diseases and what I call sort of high throughput epidemiological study, uh, as well as uh, develop new machine learning methods, both for prediction, but also for causal inference. And the idea is not to use this data set to test one hypothesis. This is, I think, the main restriction we put to ourselves, uh, but rather to let sort of the data speak and use methods uh, that can um, interrogate the data and generate new hypotheses that then can be followed up in more targeted studies. Um, um, the, the peer registry project include uh, around 5.3 million uh, individuals, which is basically everyone alive in Finland, which is a, a relatively small country, and then all the relatives of these individuals. So that's covered around 7.1 million people. Uh, many of them are, are dead. Um, and all these apps, uh, the registries that I mentioned before, clearly the registry do not have a uniform coverage across time. So for some of the individuals, they will cover only the uh, last years of their life, for example. Here you can see the year distribution uh, of birth for those that are alive. So um, we have some um, uh, centenaries uh, and, uh, um, and then they, um, you, uh, you see that males, uh, um, uh, males not count, it's lower on older ages because men die younger. And so this, this trend is expected. Um, although I will not want to touch among the drug purchases, but I think it's extremely exciting, uh, a data set of, of drug purchases, because really um, is by far the largest contributor of the data size. This is uh, around 800 million drug purchases since uh, 1995. What you see here is um, as an example, drug purchases for asthma. And uh, uh, here you have time, here you have individuals, and here you have in blue, uh, when you go to the doctor or to the hospital, to the primary care for something related to asthma. So this, this specific ICD code. And you, you can appreciate how irregular are these, um, these, these uh, trajectories. Actually, how regular they are in a certain sense, because you get a new prescription every three months. So that's means that you try to go and purchase drug uh, um, every three months, but also uh, the, the trajectory are determined by the package size, how many pills are in the package and so on. But there is also a lot of irregularities that you can see around that are not simply explained by the package uh, size or by the prescription pattern, but they may be able to do something else. So, so something we, we are doing and we are interested in doing is to study more the determinants of drug adherence and drug purchases behavior and what, what is determining um, these aspects. Um, the other important component, which I think a lot of electronic health record, especially those hospital-based or, or um, um, that are very popular, for example, in the United States don't have, it's a social determinant of health. Uh, so we have information, as I mentioned, about education year. Uh, we have, to a certain extent, income um, and, and uh, um, marriage history and so on. And I think these are important when we want to understand the relative contribution of uh, social determinants of health versus health uh, past trajectories as well as genetic. And as uh, genetic, it's, it's, it's another interesting of mine. And for a subset of this data, we have actually uh, genetic information and we can do some, some of this uh, analysis teasing apart which different con component contribute to disease risk. Um, the most time consuming and complicated um, think is when you get these data is how you define diseases. Diseases are the typical sort of anchor to try to navigate uh, in these sort of large data sets. And uh, um, there's been a lot of work in other countries like in UK with the Caliber Research in US to a certain extent with these fewest resources to try to map different codes to um, disease entities. Now in Finland, because of the fin FinGen project, which is the project that contains genetic data, uh, but since uh, it's, it's such a large project and it's kind of well-founded, we had quite a lot of clinical groups working on defining disease endpoints. So this was very important, I think, for the entire uh, research ecosystem, um, even if uh, the, the, this was generated by uh, it's only a subset of data with, with genetic information. But here you can see, for example, how we defi define heart failure in, uh, in, um, in, uh, in using the older registry data. So we combine ICD-10 code, ICD-9, ICD-8. These are diagnostic code that go back 
I think the SCD8 even to the 70s or 80s. And then there's been a progression in ICD codes. We have certain reimbursement code. These are specifically to the Finnish reimbursement system. But then we also have specific drugs uh, that target heart failure. And inclusion of drug is very important because um, you, know, you will miss uh, a lot of cases, especially if milder cases that maybe they go under the private health care, uh, primary health care, you will miss it. But by using drug information, you can rescue those. And um, when you have all these data, then naturally you need to define uh, disease outcome in a, both in a um, wide way. So like, uh, you know, have you ever had any of these disease and the age of the first diagnose, but also in a longitudinal form. And here you can see the idea is the same, but then you have a repeated endpoint. And so you can draw these trajectories of uh, disease pattern as well as medication pattern and other event pattern over um, a, a lifetime. And this, is, uh, this, this work has been done um, by, um, by a, a working group, which has sort of created this <laughs> massive script that input all the registry and somehow output these longitudinal files that can be used for further analysis. So this is just to you know, sort of give you a sense that it's not enough to just put a lot of data together there is a need to sort of process extensively this data with in mind how they can be combined and put some prior knowledge to obtain uh, better um, outcome as well as better uh, definitions. Now, we, we have done a portal, um, and I see if I can share that specific one, which is called RISTIS. Currently, is just using um, a subset of the individuals that I of, that have genetic data, so it's around uh, 300,000. And uh, what you can see here is, uh, uh, let's say, co we search, for example, for coronary, um, major coronary artery event. Here we have around 3,000 disease endpoints. And here you can see uh, how we define the different endpoints, how they are related to broader and narrower endpoints. Um, or, or disease definition uh, and, and the different step we have used to sort of create the disease endpoints. We have distribution, um, uh, what's, you know, how much having this endpoint increase your uh, risk of dying in the next 15, five, one year uh, or in the entire follow-up uh, as well, the cumulative incidence uh, of, of, of the disease over time and uh, um, Importantly, we have done sort of this um, survival analysis, uh, which is around uh, 4 million survival analysis, where you can basically compare in a longitudinal fashion each disease endpoint versus the other. So, for example, if you take angina, that's clearly having a diagnosis of angina increase uh, substantially your risk of developing coronary artery disease. And you can see that increase, especially if you are close. Uh, so if you are within a year of follow-up on distance between angina and coronary artery disease, but increase that uh, also uh, when you sort of uh, look at the longer uh, follow-up time. And then you see that, so uh, because every disease is associated with any other disease, so whenever you have sort of a disease diagnosis, your risk of having any other disease are increased substantially. Uh, what, what we've been calculating is how unique is this pair uh, of, of associations compared to what is expected um, um, given all the other association. And you see that this sort of un pair angina CHD is in the 99th percentile of the distribution. So it's a quite specific uh, association. And, and similarly, we can calculate which are the drugs uh, uh, that are more likely to be purchased once you have uh, diagnosed with a major coronary heart disease event where yourself, you are, you, you are your own controls because we, you can compare the tra trajectory of drug uh, uh, purchase before uh, your diagnosis of coronary heart disease and the one purchased after, and then we can compare those two trajectory and see which drugs are reached um, before. And so this is you know, some idea on sort of what I call high throughput epidemiology. We make, this is all publicly available. You can go and explore. It's currently on a subset of 320,000 individuals, but we are now expanding this on the nationwide data. So which would be less biased because clearly uh, these individuals are a, a sort of very selected court. And uh, this can 
provide some basis for future epidemiological studies um, that one can, uh, for example, um, uh, follow up on. So, so what I want to spend the rest of the time speaking about, it's a project which is led by Oshin Liu, which is uh, um, a, a postdoc in my team. So all credit should go to her. I'm just you know, uh, reporting some of her work. Um, and this used partially uh, a subset of the FIN registry data set to explore uh, which diseases uh, impact lifetime reproductive success. I mean, we, I think uh, it's better to call it outcome, it's not necessarily a success, but uh, this is sort of uh, um, the idea. We actually use data from both Finland and through uh, our collaboration, we also use data from Sweden, so that allowed sort of replication. So what is lifetime reproductive success or outcome? Uh, sort of traditionally is defined as the total number of children over an entire reproductive lifespan. Uh, here you see two person. The first person uh, had many children and many grandchildren, and so uh, can sort of pass the gene through the generation. Person two is childless, and that uh, sort of doesn't pass the gene through, through the generations. This is actually a real example from, from a Swedish uh, data. So why is it important to study uh, reproductive success? And certainly from an evolutionary standpoint, that's measure the rate of increase on individual possessing certain genotype or phenotype. So it's a proxy for biological fitness. Uh, from an epidemiological standpoint, um, you can study when you're interested in reproductive health. And from a demographic standpoint, that's allowed you to sort of better understand the population growth and population trajectories and to better uh, understand the sort of aging. Um, that why it is specifically important to study childless and uh, uh, childless is, is what we are gonna look at. We're not gonna look at uh, lifetime reproductive outcomes so the total number of children, but rather we're gonna compare people that never had children with people that ever had one child. The reason to do that is because it turns out there are very different processing determining going from zero to one child and going from one, two, three, four, five children. And the same, the sort of diseases as well as uh, environmental uh, factor that determine uh, these reproductive choice are quite different. So not having children, especially in the past was associated with social stigma. From a genetic standpoint, it's a proxy for fitness. There is an impact on long-term health condition. Uh, for example, it's been shown that um, having children and having more children reduce the risk of breast cancer, uh, and as well as social economic status. And then surprisingly little is known on how diseases impact uh, the chance of not having children, especially men, and the reason why little is known is because for two reasons. One is because people have always been focusing on, on few diseases which have a clear biological um, um, impact on, on childless, which is like fertility uh, or, or, or other type of female specific reproductive diseases. Second, because um, to know if, if, if a person um, didn't have any child, we need to follow that person for long enough to be sure it doesn't have any child. And so we need a very long follow-up. And it's quite unusual from many of uh, electronic health record nowadays to have a very long follow-up time. But here we can follow up people for 40, 50 years. And so we can see that they are concluded their reproductive period without children. So it's important to put sort of a conceptual framework on how diseases can impact ch uh, childless. There are many different ways, and we're, we will not be able to uh, tease apart uh, all of them. The first one, which is, I think, the first one that comes into mind is because they directly impact fecundity. So, for example, semen and quality or, or ability to conceive and keep pregnancy. The second is that they can impact the chance to find the partners. They can impact the willingness to have children. They can impact longevity, so you don't live long enough to start to find the partners and have children. Uh, they impact the offspring ch ch chances to born alive. For example, you try to have children, but you have a lot of uh, abortion, for, for example. And finally, they can impact the timing of reproductive behavior, or they can share common causes with 
establish respect or that also reduce fertility, for example, alcohol consumption. So these are all many ways in which diseases can um, you know, go and influence uh, childless. So what's our data set? Um, we take every man born in Sweden and in Finland between 56 and 68, and we use this birth court um, because then these people are 50 years old in 2018, so they have concluded their reproductive period. And then we take every woman born between 56 and 73, and again in 2018, they have concluded, uh, or at least most uh, of them have concluded their reproductive period. So with this court in mind, uh, we can basically look across uh, a very long follow-up and be sure that none of these people, that some of these people had children and others, they didn't have them. Um, the inclusion criteria is that you need to be born in Finland, Sweden, you don't have to emigrate, you need to have both known parents and you need to be alive until the age of 16. And this clearly, it's a strong condition alive until the age of 16. So we, for example, will not capture those individuals which, for example, early onset or childhood diseases that determine you, for example, to die before the age of 16. Um, children need to be not conceived by assisted reproductive technology, so we have removed that from the picture. They need to be born alive, uh, and so that doesn't allow to explore, for example, um, uh, uh, natural, natural abortion or, 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 or other type of uh, um, miscarriage. And then uh, they need to be born before the end of sort of follow-up. So in total, uh, if this is the index person, which are these two numbers here, because of this unique um, multi-generational registry, we can build the pedigrees and we can see who is the brother, who are the uh, spouses and the children. And so in total, these pedigrees, uh, it's around 6 million individuals. And now um, we will focus on 487,000 same-sex full sibling pair. And we'll describe later why uh, um, we are looking specific at siblings. But bear in mind that this is uh, an important aspect of, of our study. We use the approach I described before, both in Sweden and in Finland, to capture around 1,700 diseases across different disease ca categories. Um, and uh, it was very pleasant and surprising to me uh, in a positive way to see like such a good relationship when looking at the prevalence of diseases in the Swedish and the Finnish population. Uh, these tell us that sort of, at least in Sweden and Finland people or the doctor tend to use ICD codes or these diagnostic codes uh, in a rather consistent manner. Uh, and, um, you know, we don't know how well this expands to other countries in Europe. Uh, we have some project looking at that in, in, in France, but this is a good message that eventually we can try to uh, bring together this registry across different European countries and really to try to uh, meta-analyze uh, data across uh, Europe. Um, and uh, um, just to give you a sense, around 30% of men uh, remain childless and only around 18% of women remain childless. This is because some men uh, just uh, have children from multiple women and, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the rate is similar in uh, Finland and in Sweden. Okay, so now coming to the methods part, uh, how can we use uh, our data to answer a potentially causal relationship between disease and, and childless? So the first way, sort of more naive way, is that we're going to look simply at the association between childless and disease. So just looking, are people without children having higher prevalence than certain diseases? Okay, so um, you can just do this sort of association. Uh, this is interesting, and it might be valuable, for example, for, for when studying uh, uh, fitness or, or sort of this genetically or evolutionary biology related question, because even if, you know, sort of having more children reduce your um, breast cancer risk, then uh, even if the breast cancer is a consequence of, of, of children, the genes that are uh, associated with breast cancer will tend to be uh, uh, less likely to be passed through generation. And so the, the sort of the causal relationship doesn't, doesn't really matter. So this it makes sense if you think of certain type of analysis 
Um, but clearly it doesn't make sense if you want to try to understand which diseases actually have a real impact on uh, or reduce your uh, uh, chance for um, uh, to, to be childless. Um, one way uh, is adjusting for covariate or you know, propensity match score, or you can throw any other type of machine learning approaches that try to sort of, for example, optimize uh, the, the covariate selection or optimize the matching of individuals. So what you want to do is that you want to sort of simulate a trial and find a, a digital twin to yourself by matching, for example, your health history, your socioeconomic status and everything. And then you, you are gonna look, uh, so between uh, if, if uh, adjusting for all this covariate is, is, is sort of um, um, uh, uh, re removing confoundings that impact uh, the association between disease and children. Now, this is all good, but the best way probably to find the best sort of digital twin is actually to use your brother. So that uh, uh, when we use a sibling design, we have uh, a way to control for confounding without the need to specify uh, covariates or other information. So this is a little bit an idea of our sibling design work. Um, you have here a family one that has uh, two sibling um, women and one has a child and the other doesn't. Family two, you does have uh, only it's a single child family, so it will not enter in our analysis. Family three has four uh, siblings, uh, three, they have a child, one does not. And so we will match this person with the same sex sibling here that uh, uh, have a child. And family four, they are both childless, and so they will not count in our analysis because we always consider uh, siblings that are discordant. In this way, you can sort of create a perfect matching where you take um, your sibling and then you follow your sibling that is closest, that is born closest to you. And then you follow over time. And then one of the two, for example, will have a child, the other will not. And we will sort of interrupt the follow up time at the birth of the child of the first individuals. And then we will take this follow up time here and compare this is incidence between you and your sibling. And so you can do it in different way. Uh, we use conditional logistic regression, but you can use survival analysis, for example, to in that way, sort of, you don't need to do, sorry, you don't need to do this hard cut here, uh, but the results are very similar. So, so this is the idea. It's basically to imagine that you're running uh, a, a trial where your sort of placebo is your, is your sibling. If we do that, these are the results you have. So here is the uh, log odds ratio of the risk of being childless. So uh, lower than one uh, means that the reduced, or sorry, increase the chances of being childless. Above zero, increase the chances of having a child. So decrease the chances to be ch uh, childless. As you see, most of the diseases are before the uh, below the line. There are few above, and I will describe, describe that later. But if you look at the disease category, the first things you start to see, oh, and another thing very important, these are longitudinal. So the disease needs always to happen before the child or the end of follow-up. So this is, should uh, remove reverse causation. Uh, what you see here is that um, having a diagnosis of uh, mental health, a lot of different type of mental health that decrease your chance to have a child uh, similar for the endocrinal and nutritional metabolic system and the nervous system, and also something for the circulatory system. As expected, skin and subcutaneous uh, tissue or musculoskeletal system things do not really uh, have, have a large impact. When we look at men, which it's, it's, it's you know, highly unexplored as well, you will see that again, mental health uh, has a substantial impact on um, the chances of being childless. Um, these are not small effects. Uh, I think this is, um, well, this is, I think, reduced like something 60% or 70% your chances to, um, to have a child if you have, a, for example, a diagnosis of schizophrenia. Um, uh, but you see, interesting, there's something on the digestive system as well, um, and so on. Now, I don't have time to 
go into each of these diseases, but they are a little interesting story to be told about of that. When we compare uh, men and women, that's uh, some interesting result come out. First of all, mental health related disorders have a stronger impact on uh, the chance of, of um, uh, having a child in men than in women. This reflects uh, something no, we're sort of externalizing behavior uh, or certain type of uh, uh, behavior that uh, in men are seen as negative. They tend to be seen more positive in women, so they increase the chance to uh, um, find partners and, and, and then therefore having children. Uh, interesting myopia, for example, it's uh, something that uh, decreases the chance much more in, in men than in women. In women, there is something more related to sort of uh, um, maybe a biological effect like diabetes, which is known uh, uh, to uh, increase the risk of, of, of preeclampsia and other diseases that impact directly um, um, uh, the, the chances of, of, of having children or having healthy children, as well as, as, as the myocarditis as well. The impact, it's disease specific, so you will see that uh, not for all diseases, the, what time you are diagnosed with this disease has the same impact on the chance of having a child over a lifetime. For example, for obesity, if you are diagnosed with obesity on younger ages, have a more severe effect on the chances of having children lifetime than being diagnosed with obesity later in life still before having children, but you know, are probably also reflecting the severity of, of obesity. And this is specifically strong in women, in men see less, less effect. Alcohol dependence is the opposite effect. It became worse and worse um, in the, your chances to, to, to find the, uh, a partners and then having children. While for other, uh, other diseases, the effect is, um, is pretty consistent across age, for example, schizophrenia. If you put everything together, so these are all the diseases that are associated with your chance of having a, over a lifetime a child, you see that for women, the lower point, which is these red dots, is around 20, 25 years of age, and for men, it's around 26, 30 years of age. And this is really the period where you are searching for a partners and uh, where these diseases matter most. If indeed, the average, this, is, this period is just above, be, before uh, the average time of average age of first birth, which is 26 uh, in women and 29 in men. So it's clear that these diseases have something to do to the period you are find uh, a partners. So, um, what, what's, what, what's the main reason why these diseases impact your, your chance to have a, a child over a lifetime? Well, the main reason is that most of these diseases, they impact the chance to find the partners. Indeed, if you look at the correlation between the effect of the disease on having a child and the effect of the disease in finding a spouse, you see there is almost a perfect correlation. Interesting. The correlation, it is strongest in men than in women, really reflecting how women will still have some diseases that truly uh, don't have to do with the partner selection, but rather they go through a process of, you know, a more biological direct process. Why for men, the impact is mostly through the chances to find a partner. So what's happened if we then look only among married individuals? So now we uh, exclude the sort of the, the possibility that uh, you know, you, you, you don't find a partner. We take only people that have married. And uh, then we look how these diseases impact uh, once you're married, a chance to have a child. What you see here is that, again, most of the impact here goes through some of the mental health related disorder. Um, and this is, this is quite interesting. I think it's, it's, it's an unclear why uh, probably you know, familiar instability uh, or willingness to have a child. And uh, clearly for women uh, has more to do with, with, uh, um, with fecundity. So you see uh, an impact on, on obesity. And, uh, uh, and, and I think this is, you know, partially uh, related to, 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 uh, to miscarriage as well. Now there was some, Weird result, if you remember, when we look at this plot, 
um, you see that there are some diseases that increase the chance of having children. And so we were really puzzled by that. What, what, this, what does that really mean? And in, in men, this, uh, so the first thing so, uh, that you can see that there are some things that pop up both in men and in women, and actually replicate very clearly both in Finland and in Sweden. And those are tonsillitis and appendicitis, which are both diseases of the lymphoid system. And then for men specific, you have the musculoskeletal injuries. Um, and in particularly the, the arrangement of knee. But if you look here on the underlying plot, you see that there are a lot of sort of positive association between this musculoskeletal system and number of children. Now, our hypothesis for men is that this is probably due to the fact that men that are engaging more in sport uh, and uh, have a more active life are probably higher chance to find a partner and so to have children. So in a sense, it's a failure in correcting for potential confoundings. Um, while the tonsillite and appendicitis remain a little bit more puzzling. So to understand if this was some kind of causal relationship, for example, something related to the immune system or so on, we um, um, ask help to genetic. Since for a subset of these individuals, around 300,000, we have genetic information and we have defined exactly the same diseases and the same phenotype in the same way, uh, we can uh, do both genetic correlation and Mendelian randomization to understand if there is some causal relationship. Genetic is very powerful because uh, through something like Mendelian randomization, you um, um, uh, have sort of less problem related to reverse causation, but you can sort of see if there is a clear biological uh, signal that overlap both these diseases and the chance of, of uh, you know, um, of having children, so your, your, your uh, fertility. So when we look at genetic correlation, so are the genetic signal that underlying tonsillitis um, or the risk of having tonsillitis overlap the uh, genetic signal for, for fertility, you see that there is a negative genetic correlation. So this is consistent with the epidemiological observation where uh, uh, you know having a higher chance of um, of having, oh, well, sorry, this is, this should be a positive genetic correlation. Okay, so they have a negative genetic correlation. So increased risk of tonsillitis, decreased risk of the children. So it goes in the opposite direction that, than what observed on the epidemiological association. And then when we do um, MR analysis, uh, you see that there is actually um, no relationship or at least no relationship that is, that is significant. So we believe that uh, the relationship that we see between um, mm, uh, these diseases and fertility is probably not causal. There's something else going on and we don't know exactly what. It might be some residual confounding or something like that. So um, just to summarize this part, um, mental health, physical disability and diabetes have the largest impact on being childless. Uh, the, there is a, a sex specific effect where mental health has a more severe impact than women, uh, while diabetes impact more women than men. There is a strong age dependent effect that is observed for some diseases. Uh, for most diseases, the strongest effect is seen for diagnosis, which really happen around the period when you find a partner. And most diseases impact uh, the, the lifetime risk of being child of, of uh, um, of having uh, or not having children uh, by uh, reducing the chances to find a partner. Is I think a misspelling, not, yeah, well, I guess you can call it being childless, not yourself, but not having children. Yes, that's correct. Um, and uh, um, it's clear that some mental and endocrine diseases can increase child, childless even among married couples. So this is an effect that is independent on, on the chances to find a partner. And there are very few diseases that increase the chance of having a child as we expected. Uh, some are puzzle like remo removal of lymphoid organs and musculoskeletal injuries in men. It's unclear why actually this relationship between tonsillitis and, and uh, um, fertility has been reported before in the literature, but uh, it remained quite puzzling what's going on there. Um, 
I will just use my last uh, four minutes to uh, just show you um, a slightly different angle to this analysis, which is um, what's the impact on uh, the disease risk that you experience on your sibling. So um, you share with your sibling genetics, so 50% of your gene, but you also share the environment, uh, especially during the pre-reproductive period. So you share socioeconomic status, parenting lifestyle, and access to health care. And so we can start to uh, look how um, having a disease being affected with the disease, how the impact uh, is not only to, to you on your chance to uh, have a child or not, but also to your sibling. Notice that using this design, you can also probe evolutionary theory like balancing selection, sex dependent selection, the novel mutation, ancestral neutrality. I will not go into detail, but maybe the example I will show you in the end might clarify why this, this can be interesting. So these are the results that we observe. What you see here, is we take women, we look at the affected women. So these are all different diseases. Each dot here is a different disease and they are ranked by their impact on, uh, child, on, on the uh, risk of being childless. And so here you see that, you know, they, they, we are taking only those that reduce child or that is they're significant. And you see that, um, you know, there are some, this is probably schizophrenia or something like that that is down near the list. But what you can appreciate then, if you take unaffected sister, so they're not being diagnosed with the disease. The only thing they are is just that they are your sister of these affected uh, uh, individuals. They also tend to have a, a, a lower, or for some of diseases, they tend to have lower chance of having, uh, of having children. Um, this is in men, you see that actually the relationship, so this decrease in the sibling or in the unaffected sibling is a little bit stronger in men than in women. It's not sure why, probably because siblings, they are maybe more reactive to the uh, familiar environment than, 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 than sister, or they tend to be more similar uh, uh, once exposed to certain familiar environment. But you see that overall, unaffected sibling of affected individuals have on average more childlessness proportionate to the impact of the disease on lifetime childness. So stronger and more impactful is on your risk of being childless. Uh, um, uh, stronger is also the effect on your sibling that does not have the disease. There is some sex specific effect. Uh, um, and uh, I, you might see here, there are some weird things going on. So there are some diseases that in the affected uh, individual, they reduce the chance of having children, but then in your unaffected sister, they actually increase the chances of having children. So what's going on? Here are two examples. Um, schizophrenia is the typical example where if you have schizophrenia, you have very low chances of having children, both in men and in women, a little bit stronger in men than in women, as I mentioned before. Um, but the impact is there even in your brother and sister, even if they're not being diagnosed with schizophrenia. If you think about this from an environmental perspective, this can be the shared familial environment. If you think that on a genetic perspective, this is probably both polygenic and the novel a signal that is in, inherited. And so it brings you somehow to the spectrum and you're maybe not diagnosed with schizophrenia, but you show uh, some of the traits that reduce your chance of, of having child, children. But then if you look at alcohol dependence, you see that affected individuals that are diagnosed with alcohol dependence, they have substantial increased risk of having children more in men than in women. And this has been, uh, we, we showed it before. But then actually an affected sister of people with alcohol dependence tend to have more children. This is what we call, if you think it again from a, um, a, a sort of genetic uh, standpoint is what we call balancing selection or sex dependent selection. So that uh, this, the genetic predisposition when once you sort of go above the, the, the tip of being diagnosed with the disease or uh, you know, develop a severe form of the disease that impact your life by reducing your chance, but a sort of a, an average dose or, or an average level of genetic risk 
for alcohol dependence in women is actually increasing the chance of having children, for example, uh, by uh, this, is, this is related with risk taking and externalizes behavior, which are traits that are typically more appreciated in women than in men, and so they, they increase their uh, reproductive success. Okay, so um, here it's that unaffected sibling of affected individual have on average less children proportionate to the impact of the disease on lifetime number of, of children. Also put, put in, in, in other word, uh, if, if you have a, a, a disease that uh, decrease your chances of having a child, your unaffected sibling is a little bit on higher risk of not having a child as well. Um, there is a sex specific effect that the influence are larger in, in brothers than in sisters. And then for some diseases, they are sort of called underbalancing selection uh, or, or, or sort of other mechanism in play, but you uh, have a lower chance to have a child, but your sister, for example, have a higher chance to have a child and these two things sort of balance out. So um, just to draw some conclusion about this work, um, I put exploration of the lifetime reproductive success uh, really allowed for the first time to compare magnitude of effect, which is very important. And I think why I'm a big fan of this iTroput exploration is because when you have paper just focusing on one disease and one relationship with an outcome, you cannot understand how important are in the big scheme of things. But when you compare all of them, you can start to see uh, really the, uh, the magnitude uh, of, of the effect. Um, and then it allowed to identify, for example, novel hypotheses or diseases that are not traditionally explored in their relationship with reproductive outcome. It's quite striking to see how mental health related diseases substantially increase the risk of being childless, uh, mostly by reducing the chance of finding partner. This is sort of, I think, overall uh, highly underappreciated when we think about um, um, uh, you know, reproduction. We always think about diseases that have direct impact on reproduction. We don't think about diseases that are mediated to, for example, finding uh, partners. We are now calculating how many children sort of are uh, pre pre prevented in a sense by um, mm, or, or, or reduction in total number of children attributable to um, mm, mental health related issues. There are some unexpected findings, uh, like lymphoid organs and the relation with fecundity. Probably is not causal. We don't know what's going on. And then uh, the disease impact on, on childness transmit within family, either via genes or familial environment. And it's quite interesting to see a balancing effect uh, for few diseases. Um, this is all from my side. And this is really, uh, I, I, I don't have an acknowledged slide because I uh, kind of the first time I'm presenting this, but um, um, this is all work of Oshing, and so uh, this is really all the uh, thanks should, should go to her. Thank you, Andrea. Now, are there questions from the, the audience? Yeah. We are sending a round of virtual applause to you, as you can see here on, on Zoom. Um, so let me see. Yes, there are several questions. So Bowen goes first, then Giovanni, then Lucas. Bowen, please. Can you hear me? OK. We can hear you, but lo rather low. Please go close to the mic. Um, OK. So thanks for the very interesting talk. Uh, I just have one question. So I see that the data you collected are mostly uh, from the Finland and Sweden, right? So those are the countries with very high average income. So. Do you expect uh, the results to be very different if you apply your methods on like the data collected on those regions with uh, average median income or very low income? Mm. Yeah, I think uh, in a sense, uh, we are capturing an older cohort of Sweden and Finnish. So they might be more similar to lower income uh, um, or, or lower income country because this is not the modern so, for example, type 2 1 diabetes is, is associated with having less children um, there, but with the advancing medical system, we almost don't see that anymore. But uh, I would think that, uh, um, you know, clearly there are going to be some differences in uh, 
um, lower income country. And I think a, a difference is going to be, especially when we look at mental health. Uh, in some country, uh, especially in, in, uh, in African country, for example, there is an enormous stigma uh, on mental health. And so it's almost impossible if you uh, have a, a certain mental health diseases to find a partner. And so maybe some of those effects in country where there's still like large stigma on mental health um, will have a larger effect. But if anything, I think probably the effect would be exacerbated. Yeah. Thank you, Bowen. Thank you, Andrea. Giovanni is next. Thank you for your talk. It's pretty interesting. My question is, uh, um, considering that a lot of the data that you had to gather is on a pretty long time scale, since you have to wait for people to have children, you have to measure whether they don't have children and so on. Have you had the need or have you thought of controlling for socioeconomic factors and their changes during time? Because, for example, many societies tended and lowering the number of children they have quite naturally, or because some of them could be confounders. I could see poverty, for example, being a cause of mental health issues and not having children, or possibly some minor factors like uh, uh, lipoid removal could be because some people could afford that operation and then they are more affluent and can afford to have children as well. So I could see some confounders in those factors. Have you had the need to correct for them or have you thought of doing so? Yeah, so, so I mean, I guess that's the, the, the biggest challenge, right? The confounding and how you, you claim this cause. Out of. I think, uh, you know, because we use this sibling design, your control is not someone in the population. Your control is always your sibling. So we are only comparing yourself with the sibling, which means that we are looking exactly at the time period. So we're looking at the time period. We are looking at a rather similar and match um, socioeconomic status or familiar socioeconomic status because these individuals, they... You know, you tend to have children quite young, so you have spent most of your life living with your brother, and then you move out, and then you start to have children. But most of that is is kind of controlled. You live uh, most of the time in the same geographical area, so so the sibling design is the best we can do. Probably twin design will be really the best you can do because then you're born exactly at the same time. But this is sort of the the sort of the way we use to get to um, sort of. Uh, avoid problem with compounding. When we, we do also population-based analysis, so what you suggest comparing each person with the overall population, there we adjust for uh, familiar uh, income, we adjust for covariates, we adjust for time and other things. But you clearly see for, um, you know, for this disease where you expect to see an effect, you clearly see that uh, the sibling design works much better than just um, you know, any type of sort of statistical correction. Thank you. Thank you. Very quickly, uh, like a very quick follow up questions. If you adjust for siblings, can you see a difference on whether the sibling you used to adjust is older or younger? Like, uh, uh, that's a I good would question. Be, yeah, I yeah. would be curious to see because that could be related to shifts in society, although they are probably on a small time scale. So shouldn't be it's a, it's a, anyway it's a good suggestion it's a actually yeah, i write that way. i think someone suggested to me before uh also there are a lot of theories about uh, a sibling order and you know if uh, if your older uh, sibling has schizophrenia versus your younger sibling has schizophrenia then my you know sort of have a different impact on you because you look to your older brother more as you know the older brother versus the younger brother so I think that can be, I don't know if we have power, but it will be uh, cool to see if this estimate change by, uh, by checking the order. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Lucas. Yeah, hey, thank you. Um, thanks for the talk, it was super interesting actually. Um, borrowing a bit from, from Bowen, I was gonna ask sort of the same but paraphrasing now. Um, I was wondering about the transferability of the results, but I can imagine that there is a tremendous impact on local culture on many of the findings that you that you report. And I was wondering if you uh, thought of interacting with social scientists, for example, um, on, on the interpretation of the, the results that you get. Yeah, we're actually two of the team members are sociologists so, and demographers. So we are interacting with them. Um, I think especially at uh, the findings like, uh, you know, this kind of balancing selection, like women uh, that are more, uh, 
It, it, it actually, you know, if you do it from a genetic standpoint and you look at polygeny score, for example, of uh, um, neuroticism or uh, externalizing behavior, you will see that this type of polygeny score, they decrease chance of children in men, but increase in women. And this is clearly societal on, you know, what people find attractive in women versus men. Uh, so that's that's probably changing and maybe, you know, that we are going through equality and maybe you can use this type of things also understanding how society evolves. Um, but I think, you know, the fact that sort of mental health reduce um, the chance of finding a partner, uh, I think is still is still quite true. Um, things like myopia that we see, for example, a stronger effect in, in men than women. That's also interesting. And maybe it's also sort of partially societal or what, you know, what people find attractive. Um, so um, yeah, we, we have some people on the team discussing that, but um, this is what we see in a sort of limited court and, and we will need other court with long follow-up to be able to look into that. Thank you, it was great actually. Thank you. Thank you. I have one question now before we move to the, to the chat-based questions. I think, uh, so I, the question is very exciting that you presented and, and, and I, I liked uh, some of the findings you, you showed. Now, but in the moment, when someone has found a partner, um, the partner also plays a big role in whether you, you stay childless or not. Do you have the data to move this to a couple-based uh, analysis mm. after people get married? Because otherwise, I believe you will miss 50% of the, the cases where a disease will have a negative impact on, on, um, on a couple and therefore the, they stay ch uh, childless. So if it is the partner that is causing this, to, to phrase it shortly, um, then you're missing this if, you, if you're doing a single individual based uh, study. Yeah. yeah, that's true, that's true, that's a good point. I mean, uh, we can, I mean, we have a couple uh, registry information so we can see once you have formed a couple, how the disease uh, pattern in the spores affect uh, sort of your chance to, um, or the couple chance to have children. Uh, in a sense, it's similar to the sibling design. We, we have been, the sibling comparison, right? There we're looking if how you having the disease impact your sibling chances of having children. We can look at the same and see if what's your spouse's chances of having the disease uh, yeah. impact your, your chances to have children. Yeah, I think- In particular in the siblings. In, I think it, this is also in particular relevant for the siblings because you said the, in the siblings, the environment is identical. That's true up to the partner, right? So th this is mm -hmm. the main thing that, that is different mm -hmm. in the siblings is maybe, I mean, some parts of their genetics or health, uh, mm -hmm. but mainly their partners are, are, are the, the different factors. Yes. Whether they yeah, they have yeah. children or not. Yeah, it, yeah it's, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting idea. Uh, we can, for example, you know, think about controlling or, or just looking if, if uh, I mean, there are clear assortative mating, right? So, so you will, on average, sort of, even if you have a mood disorder, uh, once you find the partners, the partners on average is more likely to have mood disorders. And so in a sense, your ch chances to have children is not only due to your mood disorder, but get boosted by the assortative mating. Uh, and so, so this kind of multiplicative effect uh, on partners on your own. And so, yeah, that's all things that are very interesting to, to study. Yeah. And now we have two more questions in the, in the chat. So thank you for the, for the answer. Um, there's one question about the registry data you showed in the beginning. To which degree is the registry data you showed from Finland uh, publicly available? Mm. <laughs> uh, well, it's, uh, it's through collaboration. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's very complicated. <laughs> I'm not going to annoy you. Honest, with, honest, uh, answer. <laughs> with the beauty of GDPR, um, but uh, no, it's in very important. Uh, well, these data will never be able to make it publicly available. The closest things we can do is to try to generate synthetic data. Uh, we tried some project on that. I mean, at least I've never been able to get anything particularly useful out of it. But uh, we have a, a governmental agency called FinData, uh, which has been a, that started few uh, just a couple of years ago, which does these things. You can apply uh, from everywhere in Europe, and uh, you can get access to this data. And they provide a secure computational system to do that. So the, the things in place are there 
if you don't not scare about paperwork. Um, and uh, these specific data set that were put together uh, through collaboration within the EU, because uh, GDPR, we cannot move the data or, or collaborate or, or have people accessing outside the EU, uh, then it's possible. Naturally, we are always looking for, for potential collaboration. There's one more chat question from Leslie. This is already an impressively comprehensive database of health information. Is there any additional information variables that you wish were tracked in it? Well, there are some that are coming. So all the infection diseases, COVID, vaccinations, those are all things that have been added. And then the really cool stuff come to the statistic Finland um, data. Um, it's analysis is complicated bureaucratically, but you have uh, um, child classes. So you can see like how diseases in, uh, of your teacher or your, of your classmate impact yours. You have uh, a, a corporate structure in a sense. So you know who is, the, who is in, a, in, a, in, a, in a company, who is your boss, uh, and, uh, uh, and how that uh, sort of corporate structure works. So you can imagine to do stuff on that direction. Um, so there are a lot of cool things you can do when you touch the economic data, which are very rich. But um, again, that's is pushing a little bit the limit. I think you know there are concept of data minimization uh, that need to be taken into account, and we are I think already on the edge of what um, um, I think the the, the the authorities are fine with uh, because we cannot just simply put everything together and ask every question we want. Thank you for all the answers. It was a very fruitful discussion round here. Um, thank you very much, Andrea. Also now for taking another half an hour for meeting our students and talking to them about uh, career and research. I, I, I'm sure you have a lot to share and uh, we are grateful that you joined the summer school. Thank you very much for this uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me.